braving the bottom line in the big city. Exhilarating new drama industry starts tonight at 9.15. Now it's Joe Coburn and Politics Live. It's Tuesday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me, Conservative MP Miriam Cates, Labour MP Chris Bryant, former government special advisor and author Peter Cardwell, and Miata Fambule from the left of centre think tank, the New Economics Foundation. Today, how excited should we be about a vaccine? It's a really exciting time because we should be able to get on top of this disease now. This is still a deadly disease and this is not over yet. The contrary, not content. Not the not contents have it. The government suffers a heavy defeat over Brexit, but says it won't back down. Former Prime Minister John Major says this. We are no longer a great power. We will never be so again. And the Prime Minister of Britain and the Chancellor of Germany clasp each other's hands. That was the policy of appeasement. We'll hear the story of the gay MPs who took a stand. Now, over the last 24 hours, there's been huge amounts of excitement and optimism around the COVID-19 vaccine. Here's the Prime Minister and the Deputy Chief Medical Officer trying to balance reaction last night. That toot of that bugle is louder. Getting to the end of a playoff final, it's gone to penalties. The first player goes up, scores the goal. You haven't won the cup yet. We've seen a swallow, but this is very much not the summer. Two miles down the tracks, two lights appear and it's the train. And it's a long way off. We're at that point at the moment. Metaphortastic, that press conference was there. You saw Jonathan Fan Tam, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer. Uh, my question to the panel, starting with you, Miriam, is there a risk of going overboard with this? Well, clearly we need to be sensible about the prospect in the short term and the long term of the vaccine. I mean, this is great news. This is incredible uh, progress. If you look back over what has only been a few months compared mm. to normal it's vaccine It's been very fast, hasn't it? Um, potentially a vaccine that's 90% effective is very exciting. But obviously there are more challenges to overcome, more safety tests, more logistical challenges. This is not going to change the nature of our, our reaction to the virus tomorrow, next week or even next month. So, yes, we need to be tempered with caution. Or, or is uh, Miriam saying this once the horse has bolted, Chris, are people now very excited about the prospect? You don't need to use metaphors, by the way, I'm going to in ban your answer. Metaphors. Um, no more metaphors. No more metaphors. I've, um, I've had them up to here. Oh, no, that's a metaphor. Oh, the country could be forgiven, though, for being excited about this. Yeah, look, I mean, we're all excited, aren't we? We've all wanted the science to be able to deliver the answer to the problem that science threw up. Um, but I think it's going to be several months before this provides a, a, an answer, apart from anything else, if you really do have to vaccinate what, 30 million people twice, that is going to take a considerable mm. period of time. And I gather there's a shortage of files. Um, it's got to be transported at a particular temperature, and that's all difficult in the UK because we've not got enough refrigerated lorries. Well, and that and is, we'll come on to the sort of issue of distribution. But, but, in but on, the, yeah. emotionally, yeah. we in Wales came out of the fire rate on Sunday, and I went, came straight to Westminster <laughs> to a lockdown. Mm. And of course, we all want to get back to normal. I mean, the mental health problems, the economic problems, all the rest of that, I, I just hope, hope, hope. My fear is, um, and it goes back to the metaphor point in a way, I think government needs to just speak straight, not adorn it, don't gild the lily about... Sorry, another metaphor. <laughs> don't... Just don't add to it. Just mm. say it straight as it is. I think Mark Drakeford has been really good at that. Um, just... Calm down, no more tooting of bugles well, and all that kind of nonsense. That, yeah, arguably the government was quite cautious, actually, yes, and I thought. I think if you heard Matt Hancock on Radio mm. 4 this morning, he was talking about the hope that this presents, which, again, is very important to our sense yeah. of optimism and mental health. But he was very clear and very detailed about the logistical challenges. So the fact that it has to be yep. kept at minus 70 degrees, that's not normal freezer temperature. Well, not in a GP um, surgery, no. You know, so these are challenges that we haven't yet overcome. And, and I agree with Chris, we have to present this information cautiously, but it'd be wrong not to give 
give the public the hope and the science that we are discovering. Uh, Peter's line, uh, there's a problem with that, so we'll uh, wait to go well, to just him. Just very briefly, yeah, if I might, on. just to say that I think that one of the bits that worries me is that there is an anti-vax movement in the world. There mm. are lots of COVID deniers who believe this has all been some great conspiracy. And that's the, the bigger reason why it's even more important to just d deliver the message straight. Well, we're going to come on to that a little later in the programme. Uh, Miata, what's your view? Look, this is definitely a boost, and I mean massive credit to the scientists that have been absolutely phenomenal at working at pace to get a vaccine uh, that's potentially ready. Uh, but I think the government is right to sound a note of caution. There are still questions about the safety of the vaccine, and then there are critical questions about uh, once you have immunity from the vaccine, how long it will last, which will be the key cr critical factor um, in terms of whether we can get on top of this virus for the long term. But it gives us hope and we definitely need hope. And then critically, you know, the government has had a stretch strategy of suppression and the strategy hasn't, hasn't always seemed clear, the insight hasn't always seemed clear and this does give that strategy an insight, which again gives us hope. Well, Peter, you've worked for a number of ministers as special advisor. On the sort of communication side, Chris has been saying they need to sort of tone it down. Miriam thinks they have been quite cautious. Um, do you think they are fearful about managing expectations? I think what everyone wants in this uh, crisis is certainty. There's been so little certainty, and there's no certainty that this va that this uh, vaccine will actually uh, come to fruition and will be a, a, the, the panacea that we want. Um, Boris Johnson was right to be cautiously optimistic yesterday. Matt Hancock again on the morning media this morning. I think that we can't get ahead of ourselves here. I'm really excited about this. I really want life to get back to normal, as we all do, as businesses do, as families do. But we need to not get ahead of ourselves on this. All right. Well, let's talk to Professor Beata Kaufmann. Um, she's director of the Vaccine Centre. Uh, Beata, we heard from Sir John Bell from the Vaccine Task Force, who said life will be able to return to normal in the spring. Bring, and he was confident about that. Do you agree with his optimism? Well, as I said on the BBC yesterday, I don't quite share that optimism. I am very excited about the news and I think it's good news for this vaccine and this particular vaccine technology. But there are lots and lots of unknowns yet and uh, we need to be cautiously optimistic. And I don't think we'll all be having a jab in the arm before Christmas. Right. OK, well, that's clear. In terms of opening up, let's say, in the spring, how many people would have to be vaccinated in your mind before you can start to open up things? I think we're even taking these theoretical considerations about how many people would have to be vaccinated to create what is described as herd immunity. I think we need to be realistic about who should be vaccinated first. Mm. And that might not lead to creating herd immunity yet, but it will probably prevent people from getting seriously ill. And that's probably the priority. And also for care workers and healthcare workers to feel safe at their place of work and not pass on infection. And I think this has to be the priority for the programme at the moment, rather than aiming for 60, 70, 80 percent of the population to be vaccinated by the spring, which I think is unrealistic. What about the uh, distribution? Because we've spoken here in the studio a little bit about potential problems with the rollout. What's your view? So ordinarily, vaccines are stored in fridges. This vaccine has to be stored in a freezer. And ordinarily, vaccines are given out through the public health system, primarily to children. Some are given out to teenagers for HPV and to adults now for flu, of course, as well. So they're to actually run a mass campaign through an adult-oriented platform, including people who might be living in nursing homes, etc., is unprecedented. And very careful planning needs to be done. Mm. And the safety that's involved in giving vaccines, including observations, etc., needs to be absolutely adhered to. What about the safety as opposed to the efficacy? So the idea we're you're talking about the safety of the people who've participated in the trials, which is the first sign that the vaccines uh, actually have a safety record that lets them uh, proceed to approval and ultimately licensure. So the safety database is at the moment still very, very slim. It seems to be looking good, although none of us has seen the original data. But the regulators will have a very critical look at that uh, when we have at least two months of follow-up uh, of the participants, at 
at least half of the participants in the Pfizer trial submitted uh, in the dossier that will go to the FDA in the US. Uh, Beata Kampmann, thank you very much for joining us today. I want to show everyone this graph, uh, and if you can't see it, I will describe it to you. This is redundancies at record levels, figures out today. Maybe not a surprise, but very, very worrying. Number of workers made redundant in the three months to September 2020. The actual rate of unemployment rose to 4.8% in the three months to September, but that, of course, could go up as furlough is unwound. This is the big balance that has to be struck, is if the vaccine does start to come online in the new year, should it be the overriding priority, Miriam, of the government to start opening up the economy and hospitality? Well, I think protecting the economy and protecting our health are two sides of the same coin, and we've seen that all the way through this crisis. We need people um, to be safe from the virus. We've encouraged people to stay at home, but we've done everything we can to support the economy opening up. Now, as the vaccine starts to become rolled out, if we see that it's not only protects individuals from catching and becoming very ill from the virus, but it also stops the spread, then obviously we're then at the point where we can open the economy up more, we can reduce restrictions. But as, um, as your expert there said, we don't yet know how effective this is at stopping the spread amongst the population. So we need to keep an eye on the data as we go forward. But of course it's vital to open up the economy again. And we see from today's figures just how important that is. But we have to balance these two things as we go along. There will be a temptation, though, won't there, to try and open things up, particularly if people are losing their jobs or have lost their jobs, indeed, because the health and wealth of the nation uh, goes beyond COVID? I've got thousands of families in my constituency where people have either lost their jobs or an even larger number of people who have been working self-employed or as tradespeople who've lost their livelihoods and haven't actually had any financial help at all and, and are suddenly discovering that universal credit or, for that matter, statutory, statutory sick pay is really mean in this country. Um, my big, I know everybody thinks that Rishi Sunak is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Well, not necessarily everyone, but anyway, no, yes. Well, I was going to say I don't, because I think right from the beginning, we had to keep on saying to him that you had to make it possible for people in difficult financial circumstances to do the right thing. If you're a window cleaner and you're paid on the number of windows you've cleaned, you can't afford to self-isolate for two weeks um, or be ill for two weeks. So you're, you're making difficult decisions for the whole of society on the basis of your own financial situation. I think it would be much better if the furlough arrangements had been said to to go for at least a year from the very beginning and to be more flexible because you've had over the last six weeks is it we've had five different versions of the winter um, economic, provision, plan. E economic plan and that for individual businesses that means well, they've got to master the new plan every week and they're wasting time and energy on that right has that made it though peter in your mind even more of a priority to open up the economy um, as soon as possible it's an absolute priority for Rishi Sunak and for the whole government to open up the economy as much as possible. Listen, every uh, redundancy, every job loss is a terrible thing. I've lost my job uh, a few times myself. I know what it's like. I know the range of emotions that people go through. But I also think that Rishi Sunak has been there for people. The government has been there for people when they need it. Need need uh, when they need the government there. We've gone into more than 100% of gross national income to extend the furlough scheme to the end of March um, and for £2 billion, for example, to be put into the Kickstart programme for young people who are really feeling the effects of uh, the coronavirus at the moment. I think there are a lot of difficult decisions that need to be made in, in so many parts of the economy, but the sooner we can open up, the sooner we can get the economy on its feet again, the better this country will be. Miata? Well, look, uh, you know, I don't think that there is a trade-off between uh, the, the health of the nation, the well-being of the nation and the economy. I think the lesson that we've learned um, over the pandemic is that the way that we balance the fact that we will need to put in public health restrictions until we have a vaccine and, and a vaccine that's widely available and works um, and the economy is by the government stepping in to support. The furlough scheme has been a lifeline. And, you know, the, the spike in redundancies that we've seen record levels was a consequence of the fact that the government, completely wrongly in my opinion, uh, said it was going to wind it down when we're still in the heart of a pandemic. So it is right that they've extended the scheme. If government continues to intervene in the way that, you know, the World Bank, the IMF, the OECD, everyone is saying to governments across the world to do, we can balance these two things. 
But there are many people that have fallen through the cracks of the furlough scheme. There are many people who sadly have lost their jobs and they are facing real hardship. And this is a blind spot for the government. They haven't acted enough. They've got to do that going into this winter. And that means bolstering social security. In our view, we should be thinking about minimum income protection, £225 a week for mm. everyone that needs it so that people can afford the basics to survive on All as right. we go through this pandemic. Miriam? I think, you know, it's easy to criticise the government for not foreseeing what's happened at every step along the way of this pandemic. But, but no country around the world has done that. And, and what we've tried to do is respond economically and in public health measures at every step along the way. And the furlough scheme hasn't ended. We've sadly seen this second wave, as they have around the rest of Europe. Um, and I think it's easy to look back with hindsight and say, we should have done this, we should have done that. But what we've tried to do is put the right support packages in place at the right time. And I believe that's what's happening now. And businesses now have the certainty till the end of March that this current furlough scheme will continue. The self-employed grants have been made more generous, business grants, etc. So we've got a period of time now to get on top of this pandemic uh, and have the support to match. Although there are critics within your own party who say this lockdown was unnecessary. Well, we got to the point, sadly, where hospitals were becoming overwhelmed. And in my constituency, Barnsley Hospital, well, just outside my constituency, but serving my constituents, was one of the worst hit um, hospitals in the whole country. Uh, and of course, we, we can't get to the point where normal healthcare, where normal emergency healthcare isn't available uh, for families. Um, so we've got to protect the hospitals. It is sad. I don't want to be in this position. None of us do. But the most important thing now is to spend these next few weeks following the guidelines, restricting our interactions and making sure we get on top of it again. Well, just before you uh, come in, Chris, I just want to show everyone this piece of news that has broken in the last half an hour from Wales. This is Kirsty Williams, um, who is the Education uh, Minister. Today, I'm pleased to confirm Wales' approach for qualifications in 2021. It is my intention there will be no end-of-year GCSEs, AS levels or A-level exams. They're cancelled. Was that the right decision? Absolutely. I mean... Uh, different schools have gone through different protocols for how they, in, in Wales this is, uh, have gone through different protocols for how they deal with an individual child being sick or a teacher. Mm. Um, there are families where um, every child has got a laptop and really good um, uh, ability to log on. Um, and then there are lots of kids who simply haven't been able to be... So do you think that's what should happen uh, in England as well? Because those problems are being... Um, yes, I do. I, I, I do. And so I think Labour's it's... policy isn't right at the moment because they're not advocating that. No, actually. well, um, and, but I think that's what it will end end up being and, and and if I might just go back to the point before we have been predicting all of these things we said from the very beginning that the furlough shouldn't run out when it did and it shouldn't be wound down in the way that it should be we said that there needed to be a lockdown um, in England as there was in Wales it would have been much more effective if it could have been and it would have had less economic impact if it had happened during the half term holiday so I'm not taking this that we're, we're just looking at things in hindsight we have been predicting at every stage of the way and the government has simply refused to listen but you would like um, Labour, certainly, and the government to change the policy in England on yes. school exams? Yes, I, I, I'm a Welsh MP, so I'm, I'm sure Kate Green is going to slap me around the ears in about... How, no, there were no violence, but, you know, metaphorically. <laughs> metaphorically, yes. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but is that, is, um, have they taken the right decision, uh, Miriam, and, and is that what they should do here? Well... I I'm a former teacher, so I think I'm looking at this from two perspectives. One is the uncertainty that, that children and teachers face, no doubt. But on the other hand, exams are a really important milestone for children. It's really important to have that to work towards. It's really important for their futures. So I think, um, I don't think that announcing now that exams won't happen is the right approach. I wouldn't um, be in favour of that in England. But I do think we need to look carefully at the differences in education that children have had. Mm. But I do think there should be some sort form of, asses of assessment. We may have to be creative about how that's delivered. Well, it didn't, work, it, didn't well, it didn't work well, did it, last time? Can I say why no. I think it's important to do it now, which is that lots of kids are coming up to mock exams and they need to know that those mock exams might are actually, actually be a really important part of how they will be judged at the end of the but year. But there are oh. ways of moderating exam results uh, using the data that we have and schools report weekly about, you know, which children are locked down and things like that. There are ways of doing this and we have got time to... Well, hang on, hang on. Well let, no, let me, we have more time this year. Let me go to uh, <laughs> our other guests. Um, Peter, listening um, to the discussion in the studio, do you think in the end that ministers are probably contemplating cancelling exams next summer? I think they're probably thinking about it, but I think the decision in Wales is the wrong one. I think what we're going to create is a system where children are being tested all the time. I have friends who are teachers in Northern Ireland and the 
uh, children just don't know at the moment in terms of whether there will be exams or, or whether there will be not. They think there will, but they're also being told that every test they do at every time mm. may count towards it. So certainty is needed. But I think, um, you know, in Northern Ireland, as well as in Scotland and England, we need to know, are the exams going ahead or not? I think just a decision needs to be made um, so children can get certainty and their parents as well. I think there's a problem as mm. well. If you don't do A-levels, if you don't do GCSEs, then further on in your life, I think when people are looking at CVs, when people are applying for jobs or going for interviews, that puts you at a disadvantage to other people who have those uh, who have those exam results on a piece of paper. And I think the government needs to think very carefully about this and not be pressured simply by what the devolved administrations are doing, in this case, Wales, um, to, and, and no knee-jerk reaction is needed. We saw the problems uh, a few months ago with A-levels. Certainty is needed and is needed very, very soon because I think teachers and pupils are under a lot of pressure. Remember, they're going to school every day. Yeah. A lot of people aren't going out of their houses. They're they're going there and they're working towards these exams. So they need to know they need to know and need to know soon. Well, it was such a debacle in the summer, Miata. When you look at what Wales has announced, Scotland, uh, I understand, has cancelled their equivalent of GCSEs, but the hires are going ahead. Um, is this an opportunity, or is it too soon to look more broadly about whether the exam structure is the right one anyway? Well. I it is, but I think it's quite hard to do in such uncertain times. Um, I think there is a question about the, the way in which we assess children and is it the best way and does it make sure that it's a level playing field. But for me, you know, the point about certainty is absolutely right. And the reality is we are still in a pandemic which is hugely uncertain and which is massively disruptive to children who, you know, some are going in and out of school because they're having to self-isolate. We don't know what the next few months are going to hold. And so it feels right that if you're trying to provide certainty, you make the decision that we are in unprecedented times, we'll cancel exams and we'll use continuous assessment as a way in which to uh, assess grades um, this year as we did last year. Um, but, but it seems completely... Pressure, and I think we need to acknowledge that that continuous assessment can be uh, another thing that's stressing out our young people who really are uh, at, the, at the forefront of all of this. But you have to have I, a I, level I, playing I, field for all kids. Well, let me have to respond. I, I agree about the point on continuous assessment, but we are in very, very strange times. And actually, it seems better to me that you build in continuous assessment, kids know where they are, rather than try to have this thing where you, you pretend you're going to have exams. We have God knows what's going to happen in the next six months as we try and manage and navigate through this pandemic. Kids are disadvantaged by that. And then you have the shambles of trying to predict exams in the way that we did last summer. Right. So it feels just much, point, much better. If I could just make a brief point, Chris made a point there saying there should be a level playing field. I completely agree there should be a level playing field right across the UK or England, Wales and Northern Ireland, where there are A-levels. Wales uh, making, Labour's administration and Wales making a unilateral decision, presumably without consulting the other two countries who are involved with this, is not helping and will put a lot of pressure onto them to make a quick decision, which is perhaps not fully thought out. Uh, Chris, you'll have to respond. I think some people don't understand devolution. All right. Uh, that has been plain all this year. All right. Or they do, or they and, and disagree it's doing damage or have a different. Oh, all right. Well, well, that's for another day. Um, but we do do that subject regularly. Um, can I just bring you up to date with a, another bit of news? Uh, this about university students. Uh, while we're on the subject of education, um, COVID tests for students in England, so they can go home safely for Christmas, could begin on the 30th of November. This is according to a letter from the university's minister to vice chancellors. So a week of mass testing is being proposed that overlaps with the end of. Of lockdown between the 30th of November and the 6th of December. Um, so that means that there, there's a sort of window for students to leave university safely for the Christmas holidays. But those who test positive will have to take another test and if found to be infectious will have to self-isolate because people were asking questions about what would happen at the end of the university term. Now we're going to move on. Chris mentioned a little bit earlier about some of the disinformation around vaccines. Let's talk to Mariana Spring, the BBC specialist reporter covering disinformation and social media. Mariana, vaccine conspiracies are already spreading, aren't they? Absolutely. They've been spreading for weeks, in fact. It's something I've been investigating on Facebook, in Facebook groups, on Instagram, on TikTok. They're all over the place. And uh, as expected, we saw those conspiracies flare up and begin to go even more viral yesterday. A lot of the same claims. It's important to differentiate between legitimate concerns about a vaccine, that it's properly tested, that it's safe. And then these outlandish conspiracies, for instance, the suggestion that uh, a vaccine is going to be a tool for mass genocide or a way of inserting 
microchips into the entire population. Mm. Um, and those kinds of conspiracies I have been seeing in parent group chats, in local Facebook groups, and on Instagram feeds of younger people as well. It's not just hardcore conspiracy theorists, but a lot of people who have been repeatedly exposed to this stuff. And when news like this breaks, as we saw yesterday about the vaccine, mm. it all flares up again. Right, now what about government um, and action by the tech companies? This has obviously been a big worry, vaccine disinformation, for months. And so it's something that tech companies have looked to make uh, moves about, looked to act on. We saw that YouTube uh, introduced new policies to limit the spread of vaccine misinformation on its platform. And Facebook also banned ads on its platform that uh, include vaccine disinformation. But for many, that just isn't enough. This stuff has been slowly building for months on end. Um, and then, obviously, there's the question of the online harms bill. Um, back, in, back in the summertime, uh, there was a... A really quite damning report from the DCMS committee about a failure to introduce this online harms bill before all the, the storm of vaccine disinformation that we're seeing and we're yet to see any further action on this other than uh, a few kind of comments from from ministers and scientists uh, there doesn't appear to be any plan to tackle mm. vaccine disinformation right uh, Mariana stick with us uh, just for the moment um, Chris you were sort of commenting uh, to yourself about what the action is being taken between the government and the tech companies they are agreed something has to be done um, is it enough no I mean everybody's somebody's got to do something is what everybody's mm. saying and, and it's not good enough uh, and for well, that matter I mean one of the bits that the government has alerted to us is uh, already but not done anything about as far as I'm aware is deliberate misinformation from other state actors like Russia um, around the vaccine um, I, I mean I'm, and I've been on radio programs where I've been howled at by people who are COVID deniers uh, I'm, I'm fortunately some of those have found a safe haven in um, Trump supporters as well and there's a kind of coagulation of madness around the world. Well, let's stick to the action that's been taken. Now, the government has said, as Mariana was pointing out, that they have agreed with the big tech companies uh, on social media that action will be taken and that they won't profit from or promote anti-vax disinformation in this particular case. But what they've actually said, the form of words, is they're committed to the principle. That doesn't sound very committed to me to actually doing anything about it. What do you think? Well, I think it's an important step forwards, both to recognise that it's a phenomenon, that it could be harmful, and also to, to take the first step uh, in doing something about it. But I agree, it's not an easy problem to tackle. And as Chris said, it's not only companies that are profiting from this. There are maybe state actors. There also are individuals who aren't profiting from it, but are spreading misinformation. It's not an easy problem to tackle. And I don't think we've worked out how to do government oh. and information in a digital age yet in a way that is safe. And the problem with the internet is it brings people together who have extreme views into you know, into one space, which they can then spread and give yeah. credibility to their views. And that is hugely damaging. And if you look at the anti-vax um, history itself, I mean, vaccination is the biggest advance in public health alongside clean water that we've that we've seen what? over the past 200 years. And we should be promoting that. Um, but it's very difficult to see how you stop individuals and small groups of individuals oh. from spreading these kind of... Well, they're also committed online. to taking this stuff down and they have taken it down, but not that quickly. No, they're very, very slow. And, and but what does that mean? I mean, how quickly can they get this stuff down? Well, they should be able to get it down within hours and uh, they should have algorithms that are spotting it apart from anything else um, and they should be investing in that. But I guess they're um, nervous about that. Just an interesting um, fact. If I, I think I'm right in saying we've only had a flu vaccine since 2001. And if you look at the number of people who died of... Uh, a number of people who died of flu, um, it, it fell off a cliff after 2001. But even in the years before flu, um, more people died this year of COVID than before we had a vaccine for flu, all the way back to 1959. So all these COVID deniers mm. who are out there, I think we really have to push back. And every politician and every, uh, you know, the BBC has a really important role in this. Always. Uh, I know, but you end up being part of the conspiracy <laughs> right. well, as well, from the conspiracy yeah. theory. Can I, I'm just going to go back to Mariana, because um, tell us how this is playing out, uh, to some extent, um, in the US, in terms of the post-election. So obviously this news broke of the vaccine on the backdrop of the US election and understandably or unexpectedly we saw conspiracies about the timing of the announcement yeah. in relation to the election, specifically the allegation that it was deliberately announced after President Trump had lost the election in a bid to ensure he wasn't re-elected. There's absolutely no evidence to substantiate that, that claim um, and, it, and it has been widely uh, rejected but nonetheless it continues to go okay. mega viral on Twitter, on Facebook and from 
public figures with large followings and blue ticks. Right. Well, Mariana, thank you very much. I'm going to, just going to show everyone uh, the tweet from Donald Trump Jr. The timing of this is pretty amazing. This is about the vaccine news. Nothing nefarious about the timing of this at all, right? Uh, Miata, what's your view in response to Donald Trump Jr. Um, and the timing of this in terms of the election? Look, I think is all pretty uh, ridiculous, um, and I think uh, most uh, people can see that. Um, you know, for me, th this is interesting because you know th there is going to be disinformation. I think there's obviously more that the tech giants ought to be doing, but I think there also needs to be a counter, which is a mass massive uh, public information campaign, uh, which will have to be driven by the government, and that's both thinking about how you use traditional media to get the information out there about the vaccine, about its safeness, about you know how people should sort of uh, think and proceed but also thinking about how you use trusted um, mediums like GPs, uh, like teachers, like schools, uh, just to bombard people with information that the vaccine is there when it's there, that it's safe when it's safe, um, and to encourage people to use it, because otherwise uh, having a vaccine but not having the consent of the public to want to take it up en masse creates a massive problem for Peter? us. Peter? Uh, no, you can't, because I'm going to go to Peter first. Peter. I think there is no. Uh, I think there is no more irresponsible group, uh, certainly online, than the the crazies who are anti-vaxxers. I think it's child abuse not to uh, vaccinate your child, mm -hmm. and I think that anybody who says that this vaccine can't at least be given a chance to uh, to work is uh, being very irresponsible. I totally agree with Miata mm -hmm. that there does need to be a counter uh, information yeah. campaign by government by others saying vaccines are safe use them, and if this one is approved for COVID, then as many people as possible should get it so we can end this nightmare right. and get back to normal life. So, so should government be more robust and muscular on this in terms of yes. uh, action? Right. What should they be Absolutely. doing, Peter, then? I think they should be talking to the companies. I think they need to bring in legislation. I think, look, free speech exists. You can't stop crazy people saying crazy things like vaccines don't work. Mm. Um, but what you should be doing is challenging that as much as possible. If Twitter can uh, monitor Donald Trump's tweets to say, you know, this is disputed, this is something that not everybody agrees with and there's no evidential basis for that, they can do it for the anti-vaxxers as well, the irresponsible group of people who say that these don't work. Right, I'm going to bring you... All right, very, very quickly, though. MMR, I just remind people, mm. uh, and there were politicians in the House of Commons who were undermining the MMR vaccine, and there are people, uh, there are children who've died because of that. We, you have to be very, very careful, and the, oh. the professional organisations have Wakefield. to be extremely robust. Yes, all right, we're going to move on, um, because this happened in the Lords last night, which was uh, a big defeat, two big defeats, in fact, uh, for the government um, on removing international law-breaking clauses from the internal market bill. Uh, there's the story being covered in the BBC, Brexit. Government's bill suffers heavy House of Lords defeat. Now, there were a number of Conservative, senior Conservative peers um, who voted against the government too, and perhaps uh, less um, obviously, or sorry, I should say more obviously, former Prime Minister John Major uh, criticised. He's a long standing uh, Brexit critic. He gave a speech, in fact, last night, and he also said this We are no longer a great power. We will never be so again. In a world of nearly 8 billion people, well under 1% are British. We are a top-rank second power. Is he right? A top-rank second power? I think that's quite an abstract concept, really, and I don't think it's something that most people wake up and worry about, whether we're <laughs> a great power anymore. But I think... What... Politicians might. Well, personally, I do. But I think... What we, we do aspire to be is a, is a strong influence and a positive influence. And I think, you know, obviously this has been linked to Brexit. The vote to leave the EU was not about power, it was about autonomy. And I think what most people want in their own lives and in their own country is autonomy. And actually, um, if we come out of, of the EU with a positive outlook, what can we be good at? What, how can we influence the world? How can we build more relationships with more partners around the world? That's an approach to becoming an influential country. Uh, an influential country, which I think is the right approach, rather than worrying about how powerful we are, which I think is quite an outdated concept, really. Miata, what do you think? A second-rate power, says John Major. Well, look, uh, time will tell. Without a doubt, um, leaving a massive economic block of which we were a big player does uh, diminish our power. But for me, the critical thing is, you know, even if we want to say that we want to be an influencer and a broker in this new global Britain, that is predicated on us having a standing, a reputation, a credibility on the global stage. And if we break international law, we undermine that. And that is the crux of the matter. There is no way that you cut this, whether you believe we're going to be a great power or not, you could justify us 
breaking international law. And for me, the more egregious piece is that we need a deal. We've talked about the economic impact of COVID. The idea that we could even contemplate no deal in that scenario is complete lunacy. And the Irish government has made clear, the EU have made clear, that if we seek to break an already pre-existing agreement and we seek to break an interna international law, that jeopardises the deal. So I think the Lords have done the government a massive favour, and if it had any sense, it would take that favour and it would very quickly put aside the clauses that break the law and pretend it never happened. Peter, uh, you were shaking your head during that. Um, do you think John Major is wrong to say that Britain is a second-rate country in decline? I would just love to wake up in the morning and not hear that John Major or Tony Blair has made a <laughs> rare intervention in politics, which aren't very You don't like listening to former these. prime ministers? Well, they may not like listening to former special advisers, you never know. But um, certainly, I think Global Britain is going to make us a world power again. I think we're one of the biggest economies in the world. I think that Britain has got its greatest days ahead of it. And I think that we need to be very optimistic about what 2021 and beyond will bring. I think that these problems that obviously the, the legislation has been voted on the Lords, but the conversations are still ongoing with Barnier. Lord Frost, David Frost, my former colleague, is doing a great job. And I'm confident we'll get a deal. Chris. My heart says that Brexit was still the stupidest thing this country's ever done. And your head? My voters told me I was wrong. And the nation told me I was wrong. Um, I think there are things... We're not, we're not going to be a world power mm. like the British Empire no. ever again. And we, we, we do need to wake up to that. If I'm going to allow myself a metaphor. Go on. Which is that we may not be the biggest um, boxer in the ring, but we could be the cleverest boxer in the ring. But we've got to decide that that's what we're going to do. There are things... We've got the English language. That's a phenomenal advantage for us. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have organisations like the BBC. We're good at telling stories. We're good at, we're good at being the pen holder at the United Nations and things like that. So we're soft often, power sometimes. Yes, lots of soft power. And I think we significantly need to invest in it. But I think this idea that somehow or other we're, we're going to put all our eggs in a Trump basket... Um, or in, an, you know, in doing a deal with selling more lamb to New Zealand or something like that, I just think is for the birds. I think the whole point of, of coming out of the EU is that we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. We're trying to form new relationships around the world to expand our horizons. And How's that going? Well, I think, as far as I know, and of course I'm not privy to those conversations. It's a disaster. Are, well, I don't think that's it's true. It's a disaster. Let, let, her, let her finish. Let her finish. Sorry. The talks are still ongoing. And, you know, we're getting to the point at the end of, of the transition period. And, of course, we all want to leave on a kind of deal. That's what we're aiming for. Um, but, but, you know, that, the talks have started again today, and that's good. But we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. That is the whole point of leaving the EU. All right. Well, Peter, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what John Major said last night um, with Nick Erdley, the BBC's political political correspondent. He was talking about Scottish independence, Nick. What did he say? He was, Joe, and he talked about not just having one further referendum on independence, but potentially two. So you would have a vote on whether to start uh, negotiations to leave the UK and then another vote on the potential outcomes of those negotiations. Now, the really interesting thing that John Major said for me last night was that the government in Westminster just can't keep saying no. As we know, Boris Johnson wants to refuse permission to hold another referendum. Some ministers are talking about waiting another 40 years. But John Major was saying, look, if you do that, you potentially just stoke up grievance and you alienate some Scottish voters. And I've got to say, having had quite a few conversations about this over the last few weeks, there are some in government who share that view, who think that just say no on independence line just can't hold all that long, especially if the SNP win big, as looks likely, in the Holyrood elections in May. Nick, thanks very much for that. Um, we're going to turn to Chris's book. Um, there it is, the front cover. Chris Bryant, The Glamour Boys, the secret story of the rebels who fought for Britain to defeat Hitler. Um, who were they? So it's a bunch of um, queer or nearly queer men, somewhere between bisexual and homosexual, who at the beginning of the 1930s used to go to Germany a lot, basically to have sex, because it was legal there, mm. more or less. Whereas During the was, Weimar Republic. Exactly. Times. It was mm. completely illegal here. Um, and you could be sent to prison for up to two years. And Nancy Astor's son, Bobby Gould Shaw, sent to, to for prison for two years with hard labour. Um, and um, they knew lots of gay 
Nazis who were all bumped off in the at Night of the Long Knives by Hitler in 1934. They knew other gay men in Germany who were then arrested and sent to prison, concentration camps. Um, and they knew lots of Jewish uh, men and women who were um, under the cosh in Germany as well. They became the most vociferous opponents of um, appeasement, Neville Chamberlain's policy of appeasement. Neville Chamberlain had their phones tapped, um, had them spied upon, threatened with deselection, um, and nasty articles appearing in the newspapers about why are you still not married. Um, they kept on making these speeches, mm. and when the war came, four of them enlisted and were killed in action. Ronnie Cartland, Barbara Cartland's younger brother, um, who thought of Barbara Cartland having a younger brother, who died very, very bravely at Cassel. So so why don't we know about them? I mean, it, you know, it's a fascinating look. I haven't read the book, but I have read a number of the reviews, and it does sound fascinating. So, so have they been overlooked? They've been completely overlooked, because in many cases, of course, there was, there's no... Um, papers from the individuals because they died and, and in one, Jack McNamara's case his brother refused to inherit from him because he was gay um, and some families didn't want to own up to this as part of their past. Um, Barbara Cartland for instance um, in, in a book about Jack, her brother Ronnie removed the word flamboyant because she obviously Any thought that, that would be some mm. kind of insinuation of his sexuality. Right. I mean, it, it was obviously dangerous for them. It must have been. Um, yeah, and... they, uh, putting their head above the parapet on anything was risking the wrath of the whips, who were really powerful at this time, um, who were threatening them with deselection. Right. What about how we write history, Miata? I mean, the fact that they have been overlooked. Um, does that happen quite a lot, do you think, in terms of people being excluded from the first draft of history? I think so, you know, and I think we see it uh, over and over again. We see it in terms of uh, minority race, uh, mm -hmm. BAME history. We see it in terms of, um, you know, people's sexuality. Um, and, you know, I think it's really credit to uh, Chris for producing the book because the more uh, that we talk about the parts of history that are brushed and air brushed out, um, I think the more awareness there is, the more recognition and the richer we are all for it. Right. I mean, Peter, this was a, a small group of mainly conservative um, um, MPs risking uh, their careers um, to take a, what was at the time an unpopular stand, history proven them uh, right. Um, should we see more of that from MPs? Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, the greatest um, thing that MPs have, the greatest duty they have, is to integrity, is to the truth, uh, as well as their constituents and the country. Chris and I don't agree on very much, but I can definitely <laughs> agree, having written a book myself recently, that um, it, is a, it is an amazing feat. It is a tremendous uh, a journey that you go through, and I sincerely congratulate you on it, and I hope people buy it for Christmas alongside Secret Life <laughs> and Special Advisors. I just, just happen to have a, Peter, a copy here. Peter, you, you, you built up to that beautifully. Um, Miriam, will this inspire you to be more rebellious? on things that you uh, think aren't right? Well, I think Peter's point about integrity is absolutely right. That is absolutely what people should be able to expect from, from politicians. But uh, having integrity doesn't mean you never compromise. And I think being part of a party, being part of a political system, means that you don't always push your own point of view and your own position above those of other people's. And, and that's what our political system's about, isn't it? It's negotiation, it's compromise, while still maintaining your own personal integrity. But at the same time, Neville Chamberlain was using secret tactics yes, and that's wrong. to undermine people and was threatening to deselect them and purge them. Oh, yeah, and that's And I think both our, both our political yeah. parties in the last few years have had attempts to purge people of a different view within their, from the front bench. And I think that that is really dangerous. One of the precious things we have in our system is that you have a constituency, you are responsible to your constituents and to your conscience. And the other thing for me is um, we often think that our, our freedoms are won forever, but actually... Weimar Germany was the most liberal place in the world and six years later men were being carted off um, and executed and killed in concentration camps. Um, they, I mean, they weren't perfect, were they? I mean, no. who is? Um, but it's quite interesting... Conservatives Come in. start. <laughs> that wasn't the point I was <laughs> trying to make. A but they were writing about Conservatives. It was, but also they weren't perfect always in their motivations either. I mean, no. you, there are a couple of bits I've read in the reviews um, about Victor Kazalet saying he was shown around Dachau, one of the concentration camps in Germany in 1933. Great fun. I visit the concentration camp. It wasn't very interesting. Quite well run. No undue misery or discomfort. Uh, indeed, and he also commented later on in that same letter, he said, um, uh, and since they, it was only communists that were under arrest, I didn't care because I hate communists more than anything else. And so, so but each of these men had their own um, story and their own process of getting to the point. For, for Victor, I think it was A, Gottfried von Kram, the tennis star, who was a friend of his, being arrested in 1937 um, and sent to prison for nine months, and Victor helped get his lover, his 
gay Jewish lover out of Germany to Palestine, um, and then also going to Austria in 1939, and rich Jews coming up to him and saying, please take me back to Britain, I'll be your gardener if necessary, because I have to be able to flee this persecution. Do you think MPs are less independent-minded these days, Miriam? Well, I've only been in the House of Commons since, well, le less than a year. So I don't <laughs> think I'm placed to judge that. But I do think what's so fascinating about this story, and I've only just heard about it and talking to Chris before the show, is that, you know, we think now that we know what's going on around the world because we have, na you know, mass well, media mm. images. But these guys actually saw what was happening in Germany and the rest of the House of Commons and the rest of the British public didn't see that. And so it's so important to bring, bring that experience. Uh, we haven't got time for any more. I apologise. That's the end of today's programme. We'll be back tomorrow. From all of us, bye-bye.